in uh, looking for new treatments, um, we can ask the question, where do those treatments actually originate? Where do they come from uh, at the beginning? And that is almost always uh, basic research being done almost always in the universities by people studying genetics and pathology, histology, uh, biochemistry, neurochemistry. Um, and this is a work that, that uh, has to be done patiently over many years, but um, it usually leads to uh, new findings, and sometimes those findings, like the yellow light bulb that just came on there, um, actually, actually lead to an important insight into what's happening in the disease um, and leads to a, an idea, what we call a therapeutic uh, concept, for how you could treat this disease based on this new discovery. That could be, for example, discovering a new gene or a protein which we think is, is misbehaving in, in Parkinson's cells. Um, it could be uh, evidence suggesting there's exposure to some toxic chemical responsible for the disease. But whatever it is, it gives an idea for, for how the new uh, treatment can be, can be produced. The next step, though, um, usually does not happen in the university. Usually it happens in a biotech company or a pharmaceutical company. We call this stage drug discovery, and it's very simply looking at how to turn that biological insight of, about the disease into a new chemical structure that could be used to treat that disease. So this is almost always done by some very specialized uh, medicinal chemists working in collaboration with, uh, with uh, research pharmacologists and biochemists, as I said, usually in a, in a biotech or a pharma company. This is happening more and more now in universities. Uh, universities are realizing this is a, an important step in translating their discovery research into, into some practical application. But uh, this, this, this usually involves synthesizing new structures, testing them in cells or in, or in different biochemical models, finding the molecules that work best, going back to the lab, making variations on those molecules, trying to find better, more potent molecules, going through many iterations of this process until finally, usually it's after several years, uh, the, the uh, medicinal chemists and biologists arrive at uh, an idea about one specific chemical structure which they believe has the properties that could make it a successful drug. It's still a long way from a drug, but that's the drug discovery stage of the process. Uh, next, there's a stage called preclinical or non-clinical testing. So this is a very, um, a very formalized, a very uh, uh, controlled um, series of experiments where these specific molecules uh, are tested for especially their safety properties. The, the next step is going to be to put these drug candidates into humans for the first time. And so safety is the most important aspect of this stage of research. Everything is done to try to understand what the molecule will do when it gets in the body, what toxicologies it might produce in humans. Often drugs fail at this stage, and we go back to the beginning. But sometimes, again, if we're lucky, um, one or two structures will emerge that people believe are a reasonable risk to try in, in humans. And that leads us to the clinical trial stage. This is so, yeah, sometimes the longest and uh, certainly the most expensive stage of drug development. Uh, it's usually divided into several stages. So there's a phase one when the molecule first goes into humans, as I said. These are usually healthy volunteers, often students. Um, and really the purpose is to see what happens when very low doses at first are introduced into humans. Are there any bad surprises? Uh, where the drug goes? This sort of thing. It doesn't tell us anything about the therapeutic activity of the molecule yet. Um, if the molecule looks good, it goes into phase two. So phase two is when the molecule first gets tested in patients. So here, you're looking for some evidence that the drug is doing in, in the disease what was predicted it should do based on the therapeutic concept and based on the preclinical work. So this is a really a make or break uh, stage when you, you, you really confirm that the uh, approach is correct and this type of molecule might in fact treat the disease. Um, if it is, the drug goes on to phase three clinical testing. This is, these are the large trials that involve hundreds or even thousands of patients. And this is where you really determine what are the real benefits, what are the real risks for the drug, and what is the ratio, what is the balance between those. And this is the data that allows companies and allows regulators to decide, uh, is this actually an agent we can approve for, for use in, in patients? So this stage, as I said, will take uh, maybe eight years or longer, and it will cost, in the end, hundreds of millions of pounds. So it's a very big, um, important step in the, in the process. At the end of that process, if the trials are all positive, then there's a drug approval stage. This is where the uh, regulatory agency, so you've heard of the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA in the United States. In Europe, it's a European Medicines Agency, the EMA, 
They, look at, they have very strict criteria for what it takes to get a drug approved. They look in great detail at the clinical data, and they may or may not agree that the program of studies is enough to register the drug and allow it to be used. So those are the steps in the process. You can see that uh, it's a long process. The years, uh, approximate duration of each of these stages is shown at the bottom in this slide. Um, and you see if you add up these stages, it can add up to 10 or 20 years or longer. And this actually can be a problem for a number of reasons. One is that uh, for, for companies to invest in these expensive studies, they do need to have a patent, a live patent on the molecule. Patents have a life of 20 years. And you can imagine this easily taking 20 years or close to it. So if companies believe that they will not at the end have, a, have an active patent, then again, they won't invest. So uh, that, that long time is part of the reason for the cost. Someone has to be paying for all these studies being done by hundreds or even thousands of people for 10 or 20 years throughout this entire process. In addition, there's another reason why the, why the uh, process is so difficult and expensive, and that's attrition. So these arrows are meant to indicate uh, multiple independent projects starting over here at the early stage, and they're all going forward, and they're stopping at different stages because the enzyme or the gene doesn't seem to be so closely involved with the, with the disease, or perhaps um, a molecule that was identified as actually causing a toxicology um, in, in, in a monkey, for instance, so it doesn't go uh, sorry, beyond the preclinical stage. So only one uh, molecule, in this case, goes all the way to the, to the uh, end of, of uh, being approved as a drug. Depending on where you start, you can have a 1 in 10 or a 1 in 100 or perhaps a 1 in 1,000 chance of your project actually succeeding. So you see it will take a very special kind of investor and a very special kind of project uh, organization to, to invest in these early stage projects knowing the, uh, the costs and the risks involved. So who does actually pay for all these stages? Very important question. Uh, the earliest stage here, the basic biology stage, is usually paid for by government agencies and charities. So people like the Medical Research Council you've heard of, Parkinson's UK, Wellcome Trust, they tend to be the, the supporters for work in the university. Once you get into drug discovery and up to early clinical development, that is usually companies, either large companies or small companies, uh, investing at this stage to bring molecules forward. When you get out here at the late clinical development and the drug approval stage, it's almost by definition going to be a large company because, as I mentioned, the costs are hundreds of millions of pounds and not very many players have the, have the resources to invest hundreds of millions or even a billion pounds year after year after year in projects that don't succeed. So it tends to be farm, big farm out here. Now, even when this process is working at its best, still we know that not enough molecules reach the finish line, but there's an added added difficulty, that is that these large companies that tend to invest out here used to fund some of this work, but now increasingly they're withdrawing from that work. They're saying it's too high risk. Why invest out here at a 1 in 10 or 1 in 100 chance project when I could just hold my, hold my fire, wait until we get out here and, and uh, pick up a project that has a 1 in 4 chance of succeeding. So it means there's actually a funding gap a funding gap in these middle years, which means that some of the basic biology discoveries that are being invested in in the universities are not actually getting through into drugs going to the, to the clinic. So, as I said, even when it's working at its best, um, we, can, we can feel that there aren't enough uh, successes. So what can we do about this? So at Parkinson's UK, uh, we're, we're, we're extremely dedicated to bringing new drugs forward for people with Parkinson's. This is actually... Um, a little bit different from some of the other players, because if you're the government or if you're a large pharma company, you can choose to make your investment in any area you want. You may decide that other neurodegenerative diseases have larger market shares, or you may feel that uh, other diseases have a lower attrition rate, so it's, you have a better success rate if you go for invest your money in, uh, in oncology or, or uh, diabetes instead of neurodegenerative diseases. So we actually have to fight and uh, compete with other disease areas for investment from these big players. So what can we do? We do have some significant resources to apply here, but it's certainly not enough to do everything ourselves. And, and my job at Parkinson's UK is to think about how we can use those resources we do have to, to maximize impact along this process and bring drugs forward all the way to the finish, even though 
we don't have the funds to do it all ourselves. So we have to look at ways to um, entice and encourage and invite other players to get involved and make their investments. We have to look at ways to leverage our investment, and we have to look at ways to increase our funding as well. So Parkinson's UK's uh, five-year plan is to make a significant increase in the amount of, uh, of money we actually spend on research directly ourselves, but it's also to do a number of things to, to increase the leverage and to bring other players into the Parkinson's drug development game. I'm going to tell you now about a couple of those um, activities, including um, some drug repurposing. So first stage, the research stage out here, what are we doing there? So this is traditionally where Parkinson's UK research funding has been concentrated, uh, work in the university sector, carried out with an intention of better understanding the disease, so we'll have better ideas about new therapeutic hypotheses. We think that is still important. We think we don't understand enough about the early causes of the disease to, to make the best treatments. But there is a problem. You can see for yourself, this is the furthest away from the finish line in terms of years. It can be 15, 20 years or more. Out here, projects may have a 1 in 100 to 1 in 1,000 chance of turning into a new drug. So if we invest only out here, we may uh, find the new, the new approaches that will lead to breakthrough therapies, but our chance at, at, at having an impact on, a, on a, a, a new therapy in a short period of time will be very limited. So we do intend to continue investing at that stage, but in addition, we'll add some other programs. So at the drug discovery stage, this is where drug, the molecules are actually identified based on the biology discoveries. We're going to step in at this stage. We're going to not wait for the companies to come in and pick up a project and carry it forward, but we'll step in, we'll invest, we will facilitate the translation from the biology studies done in the university, perhaps ones that we paid for, perhaps someone else, and accelerate the translation into, into drug discovery using the same kinds of approaches um, and um, um, technologies that, that uh, biotech and pharma companies use. Um, in the early clinical development stage, there are a number of things we can do, and, and drug repurposing is one of them. So drug re what does drug repurposing actually mean? It means taking a, a molecule, a drug, that's already been all, gone all the way through this process, reached the finish line, it's shown acceptable safety in humans, we know what it does, it's been actually approved for a different disease, and, look, and go back and look and see whether it actually has an effect in Parkinson's disease. Now this might seem unlikely at first, because why would a drug that was carefully selected and developed for one indication actually have use in a completely different disease? So it sounds unlikely, but it's not in fact as, 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 as uh, unlikely as it sounds at first. Um, in fact, there are some common mechanisms that are involved in many uh, diseases, including neurological diseases. In inflammation, for instance, is present in many of these diseases, so one can imagine that a treatment developed for brain inflammation in one disease might uh, if you went back and tested it, show activity in another disease. In Parkinson's itself, in use today, there are actually two of the drugs we use commonly are repurposed drugs. They're drugs which first were approved for a different disease and only later were found to be effective in Parkinson's disease. So those are selegiline, which was first used for depression, and amanthidine, which is actually an antiviral drug, which was later found to have properties that were beneficial in Parkinson's and now is used quite commonly for dyskinesias. So it's, it's not that unlikely that we should do this, and you'll hear uh, in a very specific example later um, one, one very promising project. So there are, however, two significant limitations to drug repurposing I want to mention. Uh, one is that, um, nonetheless, we are still limited to using drugs which are approved and the mechanisms that they, that they work through. Um, and it can be unlikely that, that one of these already existing drugs will actually prove to be the magic key that turns a lock to a recently discovered therapeutic uh, protein or, or, or hypothesis. So we are limited there. Um, secondly, uh, the usual funders for the late clinical stage projects may not be interested because uh, it may be difficult to establish a patent position on a repurposed drug. So, because of these limitations, even though we think repurposing is very valuable, we don't think it can be relied on exclusively to bring new treatments and, and breakthrough treatments for Parkinson's. So we have to do other things as well. I want to mention one initiative at the late clinical stage, finally. So at the late clinical stage, this is where it gets extremely expensive, and Parkinson's UK's uh, resources certainly are not great enough to even do one major late clinical development program. So what can we do at this stage if we can't actually drive one drug through? And I think the answer there is going to be um, working at a, in a consortium 
which has a, a, the, ambi the, the goal to what, what we call smoothing the runway for all projects. So the cost and timeline for getting new drugs approved depends a lot on what the regulatory authorities demand in terms of data and studies. In many cases, what they are looking for is rather out of date. It's based on the way Parkinson's drugs were tested and approved 20 years ago. There are new advances in science about how we, how we understand the disease, how we think drugs can be tested, uh, and the, the regulations at the EMA and FDA haven't kept up with that. They are open to, to change and discussion, but it's a difficult, it's an expensive process. You need a lot of data. So we're uh, taking the lead in a consortium that will involve uh, half a dozen, perhaps more, pharma companies who want to register Parkinson's drugs. We'll involve universities, several in the United Kingdom. We'll involve regulators to pool data, pool experience, and, and modernize these regulations and create a, a faster and more efficient drug regulatory and approval scheme so that all drugs in the future will be able to benefit from this more rapid and more efficient approval process. So that will be a fraction of the cost of, of uh, our own uh, phase three program and we think that's a way to, to use our resources to convince um, the big companies to make their investment in Parkinson's where we want them to invest. Um, I hope you have an understanding now, perhaps, of, of uh, the way Parkinson's UK hopes to change its research strategy to take advantage of, uh, of uh, new opportunities and move things forward more quickly from the research stage through to new drugs. Thank you. If I was to do the same walk in teeteringly high heels, as you can see on the picture here, I would necessarily slow my walking down and might not be so confident about doing all those other things it at the same time. It could be something we can use to detect Parkinson's earlier. Uh, it also could tell us something about the biochemistry of people with Parkinson's, what's different and maybe even a clue to, to fundamental causes and new treatments.